Our lives are about others, giving ourselves for those around us. It comes from the very essence of God's heart, bringing all types of people together under the banner of love, connecting them into a life that is far beyond what they knew possible, giving a helping hand and a friend for the future. There are so many longing for community and care, no matter their color or country. Christ came and gave his life for everybody. We will go to anyone, anywhere, and bring them the hope of Jesus. Everyone matters to God, so everyone matters to us. So, hey, can I welcome you <clears throat> in every campus, if you're watching online, you are so welcome, we're glad you're here with us today. We are honoured that you took the time to be with us, thank you for being with us. I hope that this word brings something to you, I hope this word brings something to you guys in the room here, I'm uh, so looking forward to this. Oh my goodness, everyone matters. Yeah, kind of a subject that's sort of made for me and... Um, it's something that's close to my heart, and so hopefully you'll get something from this as I share some of this today. Now, before I go on, just to point out that uh, we are about to enter a period of time where a little bit of heaven comes to earth. Oh, we are. It's called Euro 16. <clears throat> and it's a big football tournament, and here in Europe, we have Euro 16 coming up and England are represented, and Wales are represented. And uh, this is that moment in time where before an event starts where everyone feels that they have a chance of winning. Until they face Germany normally, but anyway, we... So... <laughs> so... However, one of the things that Euro 16 points out, one of the things that football points out, is that we all have a value, don't we? We have a value on us. And so, who's this guy here? This is Gareth Bale, who is a Welsh footballer. The three Welsh people in the room go nuts. Right then, Cardiff went ballistic. Particularly because he's wearing his Welsh shirt rather than his Real Madrid shirt. But um, he is the most expensive footballer ever. You know Ronaldo's mad at that. But anyway, he is the most expensive footballer ever at £84 million. That was his value. How about, this is a woman called Safra Katz. What about business? She is a joint chief executive of Oracle with a guy called Michael Hurd. And their wages were £53 million for the year. Wages, $53 million for a year. We have a value, yeah? We live in a world where value is put on us according to what we can deliver, according to what we can produce. And that value, we kind of get used to that concept. But really, you know, that's not the way God sees it. And as I was reading the Bible, it struck me that really, when we say that everyone matters, what we're saying is everyone has value. And there's a scripture in Galatians 3, 28, that says there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is a way of God saying you have equal value. Now, notice it doesn't say you are all the same. Because I don't know about you, last time I looked in the mirror, I could work out whether I was male or female. <laughs> there were a few doubting looks there for a moment, but anyway, I'll move on, pass on. We're not all the same. We are distinct, we are unique, but our value is equal. Yes. Pastor Gary here has a couple of times used an illustration where he's pulled out a 10 pound note. A 10 pound note that's crisp and clean and brand new. Oh, it looks lovely. And then he's pulled out another 10 pound note that is crumpled, torn, stained, 
You don't know what it's been used for, but you have a sense it's probably been through some hands that have used it for immoral reasons, unbiblical reasons, horrible reasons. And yet those two things have the same value. And God says the same of us. There are some of us that feel crisp, clean, sharp. There are others of us who feel like we've been torn. We've been stained. Life's been hard. It's marked us in many ways. And we have a soul that's had some level of bruising. And yet here, God is saying, you have the same value. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care where you've been. You still have the same value to me. And you know, we all want to know that we belong. Whether we are crisp and shiny and life is looking strong, or whether we are struggling and damaged and feeling like we have so little to offer. We all want to know that we belong. And we have a phrase I use a lot for our campus, belong, believe, behave. I believe that when people belong, there's a chance they will change what they believe. And if they change what they believe, there's a chance they will change how they behave. And yet in the West, in our churches for so long, we have told people, if you behave, we may tell you what we believe. And if you take on what we believe, we may let you belong. No, that's not the way God works. God works in a very different currency than that. The initial currency that we're looking for is that we can belong. Everyone needs to belong. Everyone needs somewhere they can feel that they are accepted, that they have value, that they can be safe. In Western Europe at the moment, we have a refugee crisis. We have whole populations that are on the move. People who are looking for somewhere where they can feel safe, where they can feel accepted, where they have value. Where there's a place of refuge. But conflict and war has driven them from where they normally feel that. Because the huge majority of those people feel most at home in their home environment. Where there's familiar culture, family and friends, familiar food, familiar temperatures, familiar environment. But war and conflict has driven them far from there. And actually, if you see some of the kind of uh, film footage of places like Aleppo in, in Syria, you think, well, the only nuts ones are the ones who stay. It's so difficult. It's so hard. In Freedom Cardiff, we've tried to start to be a part of the solution. Cardiff is a city that is a dispersal center for refugees and asylum seekers who come to the UK. Um, so a lot of people come to Cardiff and they are processed in some way. We get to know who they are. We start a process of deciding whether their, an asylum claim is a reasonable one, uh, and if so, where they will go on to from Cardiff. And so we have started in Freedom Cardiff what we call our warehouse cafe. And we open up the building. For those of you who've been down to the warehouse, our building, we open the warehouse cafe now every Saturday morning. And we have refugees and asylum seekers come in as a place of refuge. Come and meet some people who will show them love, acceptance, value. Uh, we're getting guys from Sudan, from Eritrea, from Syria, Iran, Iraq, a whole bunch of difficult places in the world where they're coming in and they are finding value. And some of the guys there at the cafe um, enjoying themselves, having coffee, having a chat, learning English. We're trying to start to build in some skill training for them so that they have more to work with in the first place. We have a refugee crisis. And remember, Jesus himself was a refugee. He had to escape violence and go to a neighboring country. He went to Egypt until the whole political arena changed and he could go back again. He was an asylum seeker for a while, so it's not unfamiliar to him. We live in a fallen world. If you notice in Genesis, the devil only turned up when there was something to divide. Man 
and woman, husband and wife. And because he did that, he brought division in families. And we're still listening to him today, aren't we? Why did they say that? Who does she think she is? So because we listen to him, we have division, we have family problems, we have tribalism and power grabbing, which creates war. We have selfishness and greed, which creates poverty. We have insecurity and vanity, which causes internal collapse, depression, self-harm, suicide. You know what I think all these produce? Internal refugees. People who have found themselves far from home. People who find themselves lost. Whole populations who are looking for that place of safety where they can find value, acceptance, refuge. Guys, I think we have a refugee crisis. And that's the title of what I want to bring you today, is Refugee Crisis. We have displaced persons refugee crisis. I believe in our society we have spiritual and emotional refugee crisis. We have thousands upon thousands of internal refugees. People who are lost. People who are looking. People who are wondering. But I'm convinced that in our Freedom Church campuses, we have the presence of the Lord, living Lord Jesus Christ to introduce them to. Who can bring them refuge? Who can bring them home? Who can bring them safety? Who can bring them peace? Who can bring them value? And you know what? Generally, that's through you and me. Yes, he can move sovereignly. Yes, I'm sure wherever you are, whichever campus you're in today, there were points during the praise and worship time where you were caught by the living Lord Jesus, where you felt something. Whether you have surrendered your life to him or not, I'm sure there were points today where you just felt something going on here. I know he's, there's someone alive here. This is not normal. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you right there. But often, Lord Jesus uses flesh and blood. And that's you and I. We each have a role to play with him in creating community, in bringing refugees home. But let me share with you some research I was reading recently, and it was a survey that was done in the USA. They're doing the uh, UK figures at the moment. I'd be interested to see them when they come out. But it was looking at how easy we find it or how hard we find it to talk to people about our faith. And the study surveyed evangelical Christians and said, how many of you find it very hard, very hard, not hard, very hard, to speak to people from four different communities with worldviews that would be different than our own. And those groups of people that people were asked for, how, how many of you would find it very hard to speak to Mormons, to speak to an atheist, to speak to someone from the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual community, or to Muslims? How many would find it very hard from evangelical Christians? In every case, over 80% of people said they would find it very hard to speak to someone from that alternative worldview. You know what? I think we have a conversational crisis. We have a world that is full of internal displacement, people who don't feel safe, people who feel far from home, people who are looking for answers, people who want peace, people who want value, and we have a whole Christian population that are frightened to talk to them. It's reality. We're finding it hard to talk to people. Do we live in a world where there is increasing political 
pressure where the backdrop of our society says that that's getting harder. No question. The underpinning values of our society at large, and most of the societies that are represented in our uh, campuses, that environment is getting tougher. I saw another study this week that agreed on what violent extremism was, but it went further and it asked people what social extremism was. And over 60% of the people surveyed said that if you share your faith with a view to converting someone of a different faith to yours, that's socially extreme. That's what the political environment is telling us. It also said that if you pray with someone in public, over 50%, that was social extremism. We're a bunch of extremists, guys. Let's take that word away. Let's say we're radical and committed and urgent. Because actually, I believe that the society we live in is supposed to have a trade of views, isn't it? Isn't, it, isn't that why we have universities? You go to learn about different perspectives. We should be vibrant in amongst that. We should be putting in our views as much as that. But do you know what? When it comes to those surveys, do you know, when it comes to that 60% say you're socially extreme, what I found, what I found, if you have a conversation with someone that knows that you believe that everyone matters, they're open to us. I don't care what those surveys say. I don't care what the legal backdrop says. If I talk to someone and convince them that I believe that everyone matters, they want to hear me. I don't think that's hard. If you can tell someone, show them value, and they believe that you think that everyone matters, they are open. Time and again, no matter where they're coming from, no matter what their background, no matter what worldview they have, religious view, atheistic view, they are open to friendship. They're open to being valued. I've got a scripture for you from John 10, 1 to 3. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter, this is Jesus talking now, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. But the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Two weeks ago, Rosie was talking to us about sheep and how the Bible uh, paints a picture of and gives the analogy how Jesus describes us as sheep, and she pointed out it wasn't the biggest compliment he's ever given us. I grew up on a farm with a lot of sheep. Believe me, it's not the biggest compliment we've ever been given. They are unspeakably dim. (laughs) Really. There's a field full of grass. They're in it. The next door field has very little grass. There's a gap in the hedge. They go through. (laughs) Metaphor for our lives, isn't it? That we can be in a place of plenty, a place of blessing. But there's a gap and we go through. How often does that happen? How witless can we be at times? We wander far from home. And Rosie pointed out the scripture that says that Jesus said, the good shepherd leaves the 99 safe in the pen to go and get the one that's wandered off. And what it doesn't say is that it may have wandered off for the third time, seventh time, 19th time. It doesn't tell you how often that numpty of a sheep (laughs) has wandered off. I remember when I was young, uh, growing up on the farm, I can remember my uncle at one point praying that some of our sheep would get arthritis so that it would break out of the field less often. (laughs) It was like, honestly, how often do we have to go and bring these creatures back, you know? And, And sometimes when you are a pastoral shepherd, you feel the same, you know, it's like, Oh, God, can we just nail them to the floor, really? In a loving kind of way. Maybe even we could change everyone matters to several people matter, you know. Quite a few people matter or something. But But do you notice 
that uh, in the scripture, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Even if the one sheep goes wandering and Jesus brings him back, he brings them in to bring them out. You are not brought into the pen, the church, the four walls on a Sunday, Catalyst Group on Wednesday, to be safe, comfortable, bland, antiseptic. You are brought in to safety to be called out. This, wherever you're meeting today, is not the, ba- the main place of church. This is where we gather and we beat our chests and we sing and bang our shields and sing to God corporately. But this is the launch pad out. He brought the hundred into the pen to call them out, lead them out again. Church today, I'm, le- I'm calling you out. I'm calling you to come out. I'm calling you to come out from the safety of Sunday into the adventure of Monday. To get out in amongst the population around you. What I'm calling you to today is a chat revolution. Well, well, that's it. (laughs) That's as deep as you get, Chris. Well, there's a few people here who would probably affirm that, yeah, but, but, but actually I think that's as deep as we need to go right now. Let's start to chat to people. Let's start to talk to people. Let's start to show them value. Because everyone matters. Chatter, definition of chatter, to talk informally about unimportant matters. You know, I think sometimes we take a deliberate and a lot of energy to invite people to our church for special events. Oh, Christmas is coming. I'd better start to go and ask my auntie, my neighbor. Do I ask the bloke at work? No, not the bloke at work. They, yeah? Do you know what? If you want to start to think about Christmas events, start talking to people now. Because you need to have some unimportant chatter with them because for them that may be important. When you talk to people about their garden, when you talk to people about their kids, about their dog, about food, about Jesus, about the school term, about holidays, about faith, about church, you get what I mean? We need to have something of a chat revolution where instead of coming into the safety of the pen, we have Jesus lead us out again. And you notice back in John 3, it says, he calls his own sheep by name. Do you know the power of learning someone's name? It's so simple. How about we start to call people by their names? Learn their names. Take the time to learn their names. In Cardiff, that's quite complex. It really is. We're we're pushing towards 30 different nationalities now in Freedom Cardiff. And so in VIP afterwards, I go to meet new people. I say, hi, I'm Chris. You're, sorry, you're, how'd you spell that? (laughs) Wow, that's a name, okay. That looked like Scrabble game gone wrong or something. (laughs) But if you can learn people's names, you start to add value straight away. You start to say you're important enough for me to learn something. And they come back week two. I think as a church, we do an amazing job of welcoming first-time guests. I hear that again and again when we have people in our VIP areas for first-time guests. And incidentally, wherever you are today, if you're a first-time guest, please come to VIP after. Please come into our cafe areas and talk with us. We love to hear how you came to be with us today. We love to catch your story and for you to hear a little of ours. And let's start to share something. Let's start to share that journey and value together. Um, But when then, week two, three, and four, and sometimes people come in and they're not fussed over in quite the same way, if you've learned their name, 
That's so impacting. That says you value me. Really, let's start to chat. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. We need chat revolution. And we have so many avenues to do that. Don't we? We can talk to people over garden fence, at the school gate, in work, in college. But we have social media now. You could chat all day. I'm not suggesting you do. A couple of you need to stop it. <laughs> but you could chat all day long. We recently had the cave, which is the freedom gathering where all the tribes come together and uh, oh, it's so magnificent. And we were so privileged to host that in Cardiff. And building up to the cave, there are a couple of guys I've just been connecting to on Facebook. In Cardiff, I'm known as the Facebook stalker. <laughs> but there are a couple of guys I've been connecting with. One's a student, one's in a successful um, music band, uh, a rap band and on tour a lot. And I just stay in touch with them. Just connected with them. So we're coming to the cave. I think I'm going to push it. Guys, you need to be at the cave. No, you need to be at the cave. And they both came. And they were both so impacted. Hugely impacted. Both of them have now said, that's it, I'm in. I've caught what this bride of Christ is about. I've caught what church means I've been running around and bouncing around and treating it casually. I'm in. One of them, at the end of the uh, Saturday evening, and there was a prayer ministry time. One of them, uh, so Pastor Gary was speaking, and he spoke about the woman who'd had a hemorrhage for 12 years. He spoke about a child who was 12 years old that had died. This lad's in his seat. He's 20 years old, and from the age of eight, he has had crippling inferiority complex. And he said, I'm sitting there stunned because it dawned on me, 12 years. I'm 12 years too. And so when there was a ministry time, he ran to the front. And he gave a testimony then in our barbarian's time. And he said, I ran to the front. And as I was prayed for, there was this poof. And he said, I felt a black cloud left, leave me. And I have been utterly different since then. The road to that was chat. The road to that was connection, value. How are you doing? How did that exam go? You okay? Where are you? Now and again. I'm immensely challenged by what's happening in Freedom Chennai. Incredible. Young lad called Ben, 17 years old. There's a beach nearby and they go, the team go and connect with people there. And he sat on a bench and started chatting to a guy. He ended up inviting him to come along to Freedom Chennai. That man and his family are now a core part of the church. Fion, cook, leading worship out there. She's taking a taxi ride in a tuk-tuk. At the end of it, she has a chat to the guy, gives him a card, invites him to Freedom Chennai. He and his family are now thoroughly a part of the church. Rob Ritchie is out walking on the beach again. There's a guy with headphones on and he approaches him. Who does that? <laughs> Who does that? But Rob just felt prompted by God. You've got to talk to that guy. You've got to talk to that guy. You've got to talk to that guy. He's got headphones on. Talk to that guy. All right. And he went and spoke to the man. And this man had been on a partial fast for a hundred days, seeking God for what his next step should be. Feeling that there was a change. This was the hundredth day. Rob spoke to him, invited him to church. He and his whole family are a part of that church now. All of that, all of those stories are chat, really. No huge event, no lights, no band. Just chatting to people about our God and about what he's done and what he can do for them. We have a guy in Cardiff called Ollie. Big shout out to Ollie Lancet. Cardiff goes nuts about that. It got louder than here, all right? 
Ollie wanted to find a way of talking to more people outside of our current environment. And he set up a thing called Adventure Disciples. Uh, because he loves rock climbing. And so he goes to an indoor rock climbing center. Two, three guys go along and connect with other people and then invite other people. And I've been watching the little group on Facebook lately. It's gone nuts. It's gone absolutely nuts. There are so many people now coming along. And now because the weather's improving here in the UK, they're starting to go out and do outdoor rock climbing. We've already got one woman who's, young woman who's joined our church and is now looking at coming to Freedom Academy. We have another young woman, single mum, who's coming to the church, doesn't believe in God, but is profoundly touched and impacted by the community that she's met. She belongs, there's no question. She belongs. And she is being captured, I believe. I, I think that person's only a step from belong, believe. Why? Because some guys decided to chat and converse and connect. I mentioned the warehouse cafe. We have a soldier in Cardiff um, who's a part of our special forces support group in the UK. He's about to leave the army because he wants to be a barber. <laughs> Similar trade, much the same kind of thing. He's now coming into the warehouse cafe every Saturday to offer free haircuts, free shaves for any of our refugees and asylum seekers. Why? To chat to them. Hey, everyone chats to their hairdresser, don't they? Well, if you can get a word in, normally the hairdresser chats to you, but yeah. And he's doing that because he wants to connect to the refugees and asylum seekers, and he wants to show them that not all soldiers are bad or have an idea of terrorism or whatever. He also wants to witness to his soldier friends that not all refugees are bombers. He wants to bridge gaps. He wants to build bridges. He wants to chat. It's not that hard. Hey guys, not many of you necessarily will be starting a barber's ministry in a refugee cafe or an outdoor rock climbing club. But you do have friends, you do have neighbors, you do have till assistants, you do have petrol pump attendants, what? No, we don't have those nowadays, do we? Anyway, um, there are people in your lives that you can chat to. If everyone matters, let's start to talk to them. Let's bring them some value. Because everyone out there feels they matter when you show they matter. And you take some time with them. Let's start chatting this week. This week. I'd love for in your catalyst groups to have a conversation about, have you managed to talk to anyone you wouldn't have talked to normally? Have you stepped it out in some way? Stepped it up in some way? Gone beyond your normal safe boundaries? This may not seem like the most intellectual, deep preach of not taking you on a theological tour of the minor prophets. And I don't care. Because when people ask Jesus what really matters, he said that you love God and that you love others. And when we got that really nailed down, I'll take you on a theological tour of some other part of the Bible. But I don't know about you, I haven't got that worked out fully yet. I'm still working on that one. And I want us all to work on that one. That we will get out and show value to the people around us. We want people to find value. We want people to find acceptance and peace. And that's why we would do this. But I'm wondering, as I tie up, whether anyone here and in each campus could identify with being an internal refugee. Whether someone's chatted to you and brought you along. Whether you're here and you feel so lost and far from home, confused, lacking peace and I want to offer you an opportunity 
and in each of our campuses. I want us to ask, is there anyone here that needs to come home? So as I hand over to our event leaders in each of our other campuses, guys, listen to what those event leaders say and the opportunity they're throwing your way. Because I'm asking you, I'm putting to you that the Lord Jesus Christ has a pen, has safety, has refuge, has peace, has value for you, every last one of you. Come home. Guys, God bless you.